Kyle Ma, welcome to the Undraped Artist Podcast. Hey, thanks, Jeff. It's my pleasure being here. Yeah, it's great to have you. So we met, what, at Portrait Society maybe two, three years ago? Seems yeah. like. It's been a little while. In Atlanta. Was it in Atlanta? Yeah. 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 And, and I was looking at your bio and you were born. I mean, I'm going to let you tell me a little bit about your, you know, your childhood and how you got into art and everything. But I was just looking at your bio and saw that you were born in, in 2000. And uh, that freaking makes me sick. I just want to tell you that right off the bat, that you're young enough to be, you're, you're, yeah, you're like young enough to be my kid and you paint like you're older than me. So you kind of suck. I'm just going to tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping you would, you would be nice, man. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I'm just going right out there with the insults right from the start. No, I, it's mind blowing. In fact, my daughter was born in 2003. So I'm just like, freak, man, you're so young and your work is incredibly mature for your age. So I'm really anxious to, I know a lot of it is talent, right? And I know a lot of artists don't believe in talent. I think they're all crazy. I've taught for 22 years and some people have an innate gift, you know? Um, and I believe that's part of why you're so good so young, but I'd like to learn more about your background and how you got to this point. So let's start with that. Tell me a little bit about how you got into art and a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. So I think I was around maybe four or five years old and my parents, we just happened to have this book on the work of Monet and would flip through the pages and, and I really found the work fascinating. And so I would get crayons and watercolors, whatever I could get my hands on at that point and try and replicate what I was seeing from that book. So my parents kind of saw that I had an interest in it. So they started to take me to art museums whenever there's a chance and see various special exhibitions in, in Taiwan. And so we moved to the U.S. When so wait, I was... so let's, I want to ask you something about that. So at what age did you start going to museums? Um, I think it was around seven or eight. The first exhibition I remember going to was, uh, we had a special exhibition on the work of Rubens and Velasquez, I believe, in Taiwan. Hmm. And do you remember enjoying it at that age or were they, did they drag you there because they saw your potential and they dragged you kicking and screaming? No, I, I did actually enjoy it. And in fact, I, um, it was a Velasquez painting. Um, I can't remember which one anymore, but, but I actually came home and, and I, I tried to get my hands on an, an image of that, painting and try to try to draw out try to do a copy of that painting are you so, serious see yeah that that one okay so we've already pinpointed one of the reasons you're as good as you are is that innate interest from such a young age my parents couldn't get me i mean they never tried because they we, we obviously grew up with a different kind of parent my parents weren't remotely interested in art and saw it as a I've said this so many times on the podcast, forgive me for all the listeners, you all know this, but art isn't an option. Don't encourage art, it's not an option. But if they had brought me to a museum, I don't think I would have been interested. I think I would have wanted to go out and play. So that's kind of interesting I, that you were interested at seven or eight years old in a Velasquez painting. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that seems unusual, maybe not. Okay, go ahead. So, so they started bringing museums, and then what did that lead to? Um, so that led to me wanting to to be able to recreate the the level of paintings that I saw in museums, and so around ten years old, and that's around 
also around the time that I moved to the United States and my parents bought me oil paints and I I didn't have I didn't have much lessons at that point, but I just tried to do what I can at home, replicating some of the pieces that I saw from books or or trying to paint from imagination um, in the style of of um, people that I I looked at. So like mostly Monet because that was probably my first influence and. You know the the paintings were all obviously terrible, but I think what helped me a lot too was that I was I was very optimistic, and I I always thought that yeah this this one is terrible, but but it's okay because the next one is gonna be it, and it mm. just kind of it just kind of kept going, and I guess pretty soon my my parents had enough of seeing those really bad paintings and so they they sent me to classes with Elizabeth Locke and and what age were you then I was like 10 or 11 really no kidding wow yeah so i think i think that was a that was a really important moment for me because then i could have some more tangible things to work on and have some kind of understanding of the fundamentals of art. Um, I started started with um, a little bit of drawing and then I, I learned about you know, what values are, um, how do I properly mix colors and you know all, all the fundamental stuff. But you know, at that age, I kind of, I was a little bit bored by by learning about the fundamentals and I kept wanting to skip ahead into um quote the fun stuff mm -hmm. to doing projects. So you know, I it it kind of became this thing for a a pretty big chunk of of time maybe like the next five or so years just um just painting and then getting frustrated and and then finally being convinced to um to spend a little more time going back revisiting the the fundamentals and um read read books like richard schmidt's a la prima um carlson's guide to landscape painting i think those were those were the like the two big ones early on when I started painting that I learned a lot from. And what was it? Can you pick out a few things that you learned from each of those books that stand out to you? I'm familiar with all of Prima, but I haven't read Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting. So I'm curious, maybe I should pick that one up. Yeah. Um, you know, to be honest, now it's I, I have to kind of work hard to think about what what information came from where because it's all kind of mashed together in my oh, brain. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I can't. Um, I, so, well, a la prima, I think the main thing that right now, thinking back, that really stood out to me was how to observe things closely and mm -hmm. avoiding being being too generic with ideas of what things should look like and really observing the uniqueness of each aspect of your subject. Okay. And I think thinking back on Carlson, the one one big takeaway maybe there are multiple but i just don't don't remember it being from the carlson book but was thinking about things in terms of planes um it's a it's a landscape painting book so it talks about you know the sky plane and then there's the ground plane and and then you know different angles of 
like mountains and trees, they they're gonna all be facing the light differently. So they will be catching different amounts of light and influence their values. Hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah, so oh go ahead. Don't let me cut you off. Yeah, so I you know, this kind of thinking in, in terms of planes, I think as as I'm learning more about painting, I'm I'm realizing how I how this could be applied to painting any subject. Um thinking about form conceptually. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when when you think about the direction of the light source and so you know where the light's gonna hit the strongest and as the form turns away, you can you can observe it, but you can also work it out in your head, the value drop off as it goes to to the terminator. And you know that really I think now I, I use a combination of this this kind of 3D thinking. You know, you you learn about that. A lot about that if you go to ateliers thinking about starting from modeling the form with a sphere and they they apply it to um, a lot of portrait figures and and still lives really making things look three-dimensional and but i think for landscape painters that's it's a really valuable skill that i feel like you know maybe some painters don't necessarily think about enough. Hmm. Okay. So did you ever study in Italia or anything or was Locke your last teacher? So I, I didn't study at an Italia, but, but after Locke, um, I, I went the, the workshop route and studied with a, a bunch of different teachers and and so i kind of got exposed to different kinds of different ways of thinking um and also talking to friends who have gone through ateliers i i pick up what i can about their training so why did you decide to do that you know you're the second person are you the second no third stephanie page thompson and then Alex Venezia, they both did that more or less. Mm -hmm. I mean, Alex did study with Odd for a bit, but so I'm curious, that seems to be a thing that at least some people are doing now. What made you decide to do that instead of going to a traditional university or atelier? Um, well, I, I think I realized I wasn't going to necessarily get the kind of education I wanted in most four-year university programs and also i'm coming out of high school you know i think my my parents have had their concerns about what whether or not jumping right into a career in in fine arts would be would be the best choice because you know when you're you're in school and then suddenly you're on your own, you're kind of thrown in the deep end. And if you haven't really, you haven't really gotten a momentum going, it's really tough to, to establish yourself while having to make consistent income to basically keep, keep yourself, you know, keep paying the bills and, and stuff. So I ended up getting a, I went to the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I studied earth sciences and I worked in the lab a little bit while I, I was there and and kind of realized that, you know, this really isn't right for me and I, I really want to be painting. And by the end of by the end of college, my um, my art career also I was in a much better place to to be able to make a living from that up coming out of college than coming out of high school so that's what i ended up doing 
So you didn't stop painting while you were in college. You you kept going to workshops, kept getting better. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, and did you end up graduating from college? Do you have a degree in your sciences? I did. Okay. But you never did anything with it, I'm assuming. No. No. Okay. Yeah. That, that's interesting. And when, what, what year would that have been that you left the uh, university? Um, 2022. 2022. Okay. Man, that wasn't that long ago. Yeah. <laughs> just, just a year ago. So I think you were, so you, when we met, you were probably still at, at the university then. Cause I think we met at least two years ago. Yeah. Te technically I was, but, um, it was my, my degree program kind of, I finished all my other classes in 2021, but I had just this one class that I had to take in the summer of 2022. So I technically hadn't graduated, but there was kind of a long period where I would, I wasn't taking any classes. So that got me a little bit more time to just focus on painting. Jeez, Mia, you're, that was, that's good that you finished that. I suppose it is, I don't know. But uh, I left in 2002, 20 years before you did, my university, and uh, I only had three credits left to graduate. I never got them, so don't have my degree. <laughs> so good for you for hanging in there. Yeah, I started painting full time and it just kept on saying, you know, I'll get uh -huh. to it next semester. I'll get to it next semester. <laughs> well, it's been 20 years, so I don't think it's going to happen. But so how long did it take for, I mean, it's only been a year. Uh, maybe a year and a half if you graduated in the in the summer but how long did it take to get momentum from that point in your career or are you still working on it do you feel like you haven't gotten it yet um well i think i was fortunate that during that during college i was able to you know i did my best to balance schoolwork and developing my painting career, you know, I, I kind of treated painting career as like, as my other full-time job. So I, towards year three, year four of university, I, I was already having pretty good momentum with my art career. And, you know, it started to get to a, to a point where it, it kind of didn't make sense to, to do, um, another career because I was getting asked to teach workshops or and go to events, then I wouldn't be able to do that if I, if I were to, to do something else. And also I think the app, the one thing was when you're, you know, when, when you're young and you're, you're in college, you know, living in, in the dorm and, you know, you know, having their meal plan, you can really get a lot of your your costs down from if you're li just living on your own and you know my mm -hmm. my parents helped me with college tuition and I'm I'm very thankful for that but the great thing was I you know I I was able to save a lot of the the money throughout college that I felt like you know coming out of of college, it like even if I I have a bad year in sales, I still had some savings that I could that that I could not run into trouble immediately. Yeah, was that intentional? Were you thinking ahead? If I since my parents are covering school a little bit, and I'm selling paintings on the side, maybe if I put this money away, it'll be a little less scary when I graduate. Was that your intention? Oh, absolutely. I mean, mm. I, I kind of knew I, I, I didn't want to, I kind of, I kind of always knew I, I wanted to do a, a career in art. So I was telling myself that, you know, I'm, I'm in college, but these four years, I got to figure this thing out. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, we have in, in my family, we have a one year minimum savings plan. In other words, because I'm self-employed as you are, uh -huh. I have, I feel like I need to have one year of liquid cash in the bank at all times, one year's worth that we could live on. 
uh, in order to feel like I have complete painting freedom so that I don't have to be hungry and scared all the time and take jobs I don't want or paint paintings that I think will sell rather than paintings that move me. So I think we're like-minded in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you're a fairly traditional painter and I do see some influence. I don't, I don't think you're, cer you're certainly not mimicking Richard Schmidt, but I can see some influence. One of the, well, let me put it this way. One of the things that I like about your work goes beyond what you've already commented on because you commented on a lot of the technical stuff, you know, how to see form, how to understand light, uh, how you, you mentioned that it's important to see things. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, see things as they are, um, and look carefully, those sorts of things. But in my opinion, and I'm sure you'd agree with this, what really makes a great painter isn't just understanding what they're seeing, it's going beyond what you see right. and making beautiful marks and beautiful design. Because I've seen many, many paintings that technically look like the reference, whether that be a photo or the actual, or, uh -huh. or life, in, um, true life. And yet they're, they're stale. Right? right? Your paintings are not that way. They're dynamic. The brushwork is gorgeous. It's like calligraphy with paint. And I'm curious how you kind of found your handwriting, so to speak, with the brush, or if it was just something you can't explain. Oh, well, thanks, man. That's really kind of you to say. Um, you know, I'm in terms of brushwork, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think, I think part of it comes with experience and also I just think signing, you know, do my best to plan things out. Well, you know, I, I do a combination of some pieces from life and then I, I might grab the information that's useful from from those and you know, go to the studio and, and and work on it, you know, not copying a, and just enlarging a planner study, but taking aspects of it that I like and looking at, at photo references and sketching out different ideas. So I think, you know, if you're a, able to plan plan things out well and have confidence in the way you you approach the painting and you know most importantly I think it's your artistic intention like what about your subject that you find is most beautiful and you know you have to make all your decisions based off of that so you know this is an this isn't an ambitious goal, but my goal is always um, if I can extract everything that makes my subject beautiful to me and leave out everything that doesn't do that, then, you know, I, I think the painting is, is going to be really special. And, but I think nature has a way of humbling us I think it's maybe a frustrating thing, but also a beautiful thing at the same time is that seems that there are always things that I find in nature that are more beautiful than what I can achieve on on my canvas and you know no matter how hard I try so but that just that just leaves me with motivation to to keep going and keep and keep studying, keep learning. Hmm. You know, I, I you might be the first person I've heard say that, that you, that nature is almost too beautiful to capture sometimes. I don't disagree yeah. with you. I just don't know that I've ever heard it verbalized that way. I'm going to, this is kind of early, but I'm really anxious to look at your work here. So I'm going to pull up some of your work and because we, we have already talked about your brushwork. And this is, this is what I'm talking about for those who are watching. It's just, you, you just mentioned this idea of simplifying or editing maybe is a better word. You leave out the things that aren't interesting and you include the things that are. 
uh, it's obvious that's what you're doing here, where this is so simplified mm -hmm. through here. And then uh, this splash of contrast and color, and you might even say detail relative to this right uh -huh. here. Yeah, it's clear that's what you're doing. It's absolutely gorgeous. What I wonder is if you're just, if your perception of nature is truthful or optimistic. In other words, I can't imagine that this scene was actually prettier than you painted it. I can't imagine that. Yeah. It is so, it is so pretty. It is so, and I know you don't mean every last scene is prettier than you painted it. I don't, I know you don't mean that, but just as a compliment to you, I can, in this particular case, Thanks. I can't imagine that. It's, it's just absolutely gorgeous. But, you know, you talked about editing in, in, in response to my question about brushwork and you mentioned planning and I get that as a painter, I understand that if you can go in with confidence because of good planning, then you can, you have the freedom because of that confidence to be able to focus on making beautiful marks. If you're just struggling to create the image, then you're not going to be able to make beautiful marks. It's going to be, you're going to be lucky, lucky to get the thing to look like that thing. Right. Yeah. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but you know, I just had, had another thought. I mean, I don't know myself if this is true, but I've had quite a few people ask me if Chinese calligraphy has an influence on my brushwork and you know I and maybe it does or maybe it doesn't I I don't know but I think you know that's an interesting thought and I, I did have to learn a little bit of that when I was in school and back in Taiwan. Hmm. That is interesting. I wouldn't have thought of that only because there are so many American and European and, and, you know, South American people who also have incredible brushwork, but that's an interesting thought. You know, I've often said that, the uh, Asian alphabet, I don't know, what do you call it? Alphabet, Asian writing? What do you call it? Anyway, I guess you, do you have an alphabet in Asian cultures? Not really. I, we just have, we just have individual words, but we have parts of words that, that can kind of imply meaning. Right. And, uh, and then there's a pinyin system where we use the English alphabet to sound out the words. Okay. Well, what I was going to say is that I've always thought it's so beautiful. And I'm kind yeah. of envious. There's two things I'm envious of with other cultures, the metric system. I don't know what the crap Americans are doing, <laughs> why we're not right. using metric and, and, uh, Asian, you know, writing, it's just freak, man. It's so beautiful. It's like an art form in and of itself. That's an interesting observation from, from some of your fans though. Well, yeah, let me look at, let's look at this one too. Would you prefer to work? Let's look at your website actually. So it's cleaner a little bit instead of backgrounds and stuff. Let's pull that some of your work up from there. Uh, let's see. By the way, I'm going to pick up one of your videos. I didn't realize you had a video out. I just saw that. I'm going yeah. to try and try and uh, soak up all your powers. All right. So yeah, here's another example of what I'm talking about. Just the beautiful brushwork and edges too. You know, along the backs of these cows, you create almost a glow by softening the edge along that back. Really beautiful. Yeah. And then the background, so simple, almost graphic shapes, and then really refined, beautiful gestural, almost calligraphy like shapes in the grass in the foreground. Yeah. I, I personally, I feel like um, that takes a lot of years to acquire, which is why I said early in the conversation, it's amazing to me that you're already there at, well, you're born in 2000. So at tw almost 24, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's really impressive. So you've painted a few cows. Why is this an interesting subject for you? You know, 
a lot of it just has to do do with um, I'm interested in in subjects that that I have personally experienced and just from places that that I've been. You know, I I didn't necessarily grow up in a farm, but you know, just I think from from the other cow cow painting that we briefly looked at, and that was actually in Utah, kind of close to where you are. And I was it was from a from a reference photo I, I took a while ago. I was um just flying flying back home from Salt Lake City, but we passed through this field of cows and I just thought it was it was amazing with uh, all the various elements, um, the, the the structures, the trees and grass. Like each of them have their own unique texture, and you know, of course, the there's a gorgeous backlighting and the way the cows catch the light. I think just experiencing that in person was. It's really special, and so, mm. so I think that's it's kind of for most of my my subjects. They're based off my own personal experience. You know, it's so much different from, you know, if someone else were to just give give you a photo. You know, sometimes I get I guess asked like someone would send me a photo like, hey, can you can you paint this for me and you know that's so different to me from you know even though i i am using photo references because there's no there's no context and i i don't know anything about the place that that i i see someone else's photo from and i i don't have any experience experiences attached to that so it's a lot harder to to really think about the, the idea of what important to me to convey in that painting, which which really guides almost all the decision making in in a painting. You know, even if you can do a pretty good job of copying that that photo, it, to me that's not an interesting work of mm -hmm. art. Let me just take a minute to plug my sponsor, Rosemary Brushes. These are not Rosemary Brushes. I'm a brush junkie. So when I go to an art supply store, I have to admit on occasion, I will be tempted to buy a brush, even though it's not from Rosemary, but it's rare. And here's the reason why it's rare, because this is what happens to other brands. This is a basically a new brush. I bought it last summer. And this one right here, a good brand, supposedly, the hairs are coming, literally coming right out. This brand, also a well-known brand, got this last year already the ferrule busted off. Now I could glue it on, but why should I have to glue it on? Brushes are expensive. This needs to be crimped better. So why do I love Rosemary brushes? Two reasons. One, because they're an amazing company and their brushes are freaking high quality. This brush from Rosemary is a good example. It's gorgeous. It's tight. It's well-made and it'll last forever if you take care of it. The other reason is because Rosemary is an amazing family-owned company. They provide amazing service, they're awesome people to work with, and you can't go wrong by buying their product. So for your next painting, head over to rosemaryandco.com and pick up some more brushes. Yeah, I relate to you 100%. I, uh, it's really common for people to call and say, hey, I've got this picture of my mother and father from the 1950s, and I'd love for you to paint them, and I, I'm never interested in that. No, it's, and I never do it. And the, I look at it like someone calling me and saying, and I'm not saying that there's something wrong with them requesting that by all means request it, just not to me. But, um, <laughs> but to me, that's kind of like someone saying, Hey, can you write my journal entry from 1950 for me? Cause I'm not really into it. Like, no, <laughs> tell you what, I'll write my journal and you write your journal. You know, that's okay. kind of how I look at it. And, what, and it seems like that's what you're doing. It's you're living your life. You're coming to Salt Lake City in various places, having these experiences. And then instead of writing it down, you're painting pictures of it, of those experiences. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly what what you're saying. And that's the kind of the great thing about being a painter, I think, is mm -hmm. you know, all you know, getting to record all these experiences we get to have and I always, you know, look at my stacks of these planner paintings. You know, some some are good, some some of them are really bad, but even the really bad ones, they have a memory attached to them. Um, and there's the experience of actually being there and maybe being cold or, or being hot and whatever emotions, um, whatever, you know, the sights, the sounds, the smells, all of them. You know, I, I can remember all of that going into, into creating those planner sketches and that's always really special to me mm -hmm. so when you go out and plein air paint well two two questions here when you go out and plein air paint i ask this with every plein air painter yeah how do you find your subject how do you choose because let me go back to this this frankly is brilliant uh oh wait i guess that would have been on instagram this painting, I wish I could have bought this painting. I know it's already sold. I saw it on your website with the red dot, dang it. But um, what I love about this, I can't stop looking at the way that purple tree just frames that statue. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. that is gold. And I know you did that on purpose by shifting left or right just to get it just like that. I was lucky enough that i guess on the scene i was able to walk around to where i i was able to get it in the right spot but yeah. you know a lot of the thing here has to has to do with uh with the values and compressing a, a lot of the the different values so for example the the building it was the side of the building was way lighter than what i ended up painting and Mm. And I I wanted to shift the focus more towards um, you know I didn't want to have strong contrast with the sculptures and then this this darker tree and then the light building again and so you know a, a lot of the value planning in this painting has to do with design and also thinking about how light works in the real world and figuring out what what would be believable which i think is another aspect that that really frees you up mm -hmm. when you're thinking about because as a as a representational painter and you know you realist painter or or some people call me an impressionist doesn't really matter, but mm -hmm. it, you know, it doesn't matter to me that um, I'm a hundred percent truthful to what's, what's out there. But what does matter to me is that these, that whatever is in my painting is believable. Mm. Okay. So to that question that I, didn't quite get out. How do you pick these scenes and take this one, for example, when you're walking by this and mm -hmm. you frame the statue with that purple tree and then that's obvious what you did there. I mean, it, and it was smart, but it's obvious how you could come up with that. But tell me a little bit about when you're stepping on a scene, how you break it down as far as editing, I mean, do you, do you figure this stuff out right at the moment? Do you look at this building and this statue and immediately it comes to you? This would be a great painting if the building were darker or are you interested in the statue? And then as you move through the painting, you start to realize, oh, that building is too light. I need to darken it up or the painting is going to fail. Well, you know, it's to me, the first thing I pay attention to is, is 
my emotional response to these scenes before I start to break them down. I, I walk around in that garden, look at different viewpoints and, and there's going to be maybe a number of things that, that catch my eye. And I think like, huh, that's interesting. And I may or may not know immediately why that, that aspect of it is interesting to me. And that, once once something catches my interest then it becomes a process of of being more analyt analytical and thinking about possible compositions that will that will enhance the aspects that i find are interesting and and what aspects of it i find not as interesting and I, sh I should think about changing. And if, if I have the chance to do, do a sketch of it on, on location, then that's another step that, that I would take in. When you say a sketch, do you mean in dry media? Um, either or, way. Oh, like okay. Either in dry media or, or, or a color study. Um, that's, you know, a, another step that to work out these ideas and, and then I, I can analyze the sketch and whether it's a, it looks good or not, you know, some, sometimes a bad one can have good information too, but just find what parts of it I feel are successful, what parts of it I, I want to change. And it's kind of a continuous process for me, you know, and I might go, come home and just on a, on loose pieces of paper, just draw out different scenarios or I do more color studies until I can feel like it should work in the final painting. Hmm. Okay. So correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but I'm true. I'm going to, paraphrase what you just said to make sure I follow. And maybe I'll analyze this painting a little bit. And you tell me if this is kind of how it went down. Uh -huh. um, so I'm assuming that with this painting, you're walking through the garden and that statue was the thing that really inspired you. And then at that point, you started analyzing it. And thinking, okay, how can I make a great painting with this statue, considering all the other elements that are in the painting? How can I make these elements all work together to make a beautiful painting with the statue as the focal point? Is that what you're telling me? Kind of, but you know, there's, you know, I, I think there's also more to it than just just finding one focal point that's interesting and composing everything around it. But I would say it's more this overall atmosphere mm -hmm. and color harmony plus the, the really beautiful structure and the form of these statues that I really found was beautiful when, when I was walk, walking through this garden and, you know, lots of different vantage points I, I could have chosen from, you know, I could, could have easily gone with another statue, um, another part of the building and maybe another red tree, but just going through and thinking about what composition would work best and eventually ended up on this idea. Okay. So again, I'm going to try and paraphrase here because I really want to understand this because for those who listen to the podcast, they know that this landscape thing is a mission for me to become good at it. I've been in many situations where I could be standing in the middle of the woods or walking on a trail or walking through a beautiful city and I'm just overwhelmed by the beauty but I can't really pinpoint one particular thing 
Mm -hmm. that carries all that beauty it's just the overall atmosphere of everything around me everything it's just there's just something about it are you saying that it's it's more that that you're attracted to you're in a place and there's something about that place that's beautiful and then and then you say okay now uh analytically how can i break down this place because now i'm interested in this place it's inspired me how can I break down this place into interesting shapes and patterns and values so that it makes a good painting? Yeah. And, you know, I, I feel the same way for you know, most of the time when I'm um, put in, in front of a landscape. It's, it's the overall feeling of, of the place that's, that I find really interesting and I, I want to say something about and then it's the process of sometimes trial and error and it's going going through in, in my head how do I d- design things and which aspects I might be drawn to a, a little bit more for um for this particular painting because you know you I think a common thing I see is a landscape painting where it's like a third sky, a third mountain, a third foreground, and each of them has the same level of attention. And what I'm saying is that step one is to find this, find this overall scene inspiring, but, and then and then you narrow it, it down and say, you know what, I think for this painting, I can really say something special about this foreground. There's this, this really beautiful stream com- coming in and, you know, the mountain is a beautiful way of showing distance and atmosphere. And maybe I can just keep the sky simple and that could be one painting and you can take that exact same thing and that, you know what, these mountains are really beautiful and, and dramatic. This is what it's going to be about. And the next painting would be the sky is so, is so dramatic. And this is going to be focused on clouds and other things would be the supporting elements. So these are, you know, it's important to realize that there are always many different possibilities when you're you're in front of a landscape and there's no right or wrong, but you do have to make decisions on what aspects of this painting is going to be most important to me. Hmm. So what do you see as the main difference between portrait painting and landscape painting, or do you not see a difference? Let's pull up one of your portraits. I want to know if you have any on Instagram here. You don't really have a lot. Oh, here we go. Well, it's just a study. I don't know if it's a fair comparison. Oh, here's the one you did at uh, yeah, at the Portrait Society of America when you demoed. It was awesome. Great model, yeah. man. You lucked out with him. Holy yeah. crap. Don't you think? Yeah. 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 And you did this with Stephanie Page Thompson. She was, wasn't this the one you did with her? She was right next to you with a different guy? Yeah. 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 Okay, so we don't need to use this as an example because it is just a study for a demonstration. I realize that's not technically, it's art to me, but, but you know what I'm saying when it's not your art. It's not something you would do in the studio. It's, but just for the viewers to see a portrait, I'm gonna pull this up. What do you see, if anything, is a difference between the way you approach a portrait? I'm not speaking technically, I'm speaking artistically, right? Artistically meaning like, a, how you approach it with emotionally, with design, how you respond to it, how you bring out its beauty, so to speak. Is it different than a landscape? And if so, why? You know, that's something I'm, I'm still looking to figure out because, you know, for, for portraiture, I've, I've studied, I think for me, I've studied a lot of the technical aspects on how to how to make it three dimensional um, and how to, you know, things about anatomy form and Mm -hmm. the plane of the head, but I'm still 
looking to explore more on how I can, with with my own work, say something unique about portraits and, and figures. Sounds so, like our careers are a little reversed because I'm like, yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do with landscape where I feel like uh, I'm pretty, you're very comfortable with portraits. So it's not, I don't see it personally as literally reversed. I think you're, you look comfortable across the board, but I get what you're saying in that I feel like I know how to combine figures and compose figures. But when I get into a landscape, that, that thing that I described about being in an environment where it's so beautiful, but you can't necessarily define the beauty. Uh -huh. That's not the way I feel with a, with a figure painting. I feel like when I'm doing a figure painting, it's for me personally, and maybe that's just because that's what I've been doing for 22 years. But for me personally, it's much easier to compose, define, figure out what your what your center of interest is. I mean, if and, and if I'm just doing a portrait and it's a beautiful sitter, it's it's much easier for me to interpret that beauty. But with a landscape, it's like, where what is it about this that's making it so beautiful? I know it's beautiful. I'm standing here. But what is mm -hmm. it about it? So then once I get to painting, it's like, okay, so what do I, what do I edit in and what do I edit out? That's why that first statement you made rung so true to me. It's like, yeah, that is what it's about. But how do you know what to leave in and what to leave out? That's the mystery to me. Because sometimes yeah. it's really hard to know what it is that makes a landscape so pretty. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um... You know, I, I kind of wish that this interview would be reversed and I would be picking your brain on... Oh, no. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> those, those, uh, those portraits and figures and, and have, and, you know, make something compelling and more than a technically strong rendition of a head or, or a a person's figure. Well, give it another six months and, and, uh, <laughs> you'll have it all figured out at the rate you're going. <laughs> I think you already do, but I think you're already a master portrait painter as well. Oh, thank you. But I would like to hear a little bit more about that. If possible, if, if there's not, if you don't feel like there's a lot more to say, or if it's too hard to define, I understand, okay. but okay. Here's another one. I, if I were, if I were standing here, would be so much information. Maybe that's part of it too. A face is eyes, nose, and a mouth, right? Mm -hmm. There is so much here to manage in this street right. scene. It looks like San Francisco. Am I wrong? It is. Okay. So can you comment a little more, dig a little deeper on what it is that, what it is that you're doing when you're trying to flesh out what it is in a scene that makes the scene inspiring before you start editing. So you know what to leave out and what to keep in. I'm doing the very thing that my students do to me. So I'm just telling you, I'm apologizing. They're always <laughs> looking for formulas. I'm not looking for a formula. I mean, I kind of sound like I am. I'm not looking for a formula because I know there are no formulas, but maybe just to, maybe just you could address a little more of your state of mind when you approach something so complex. Can you describe how you break this down and figure out what it is that needs to be left out and what needs to be kept in? Well, let's see. Well, I'll talk about this painting kind of the Okay. It's I think the first thing to me was the feeling of light and atmosphere of that particular day that was my first thought was there these beautiful lights streaking across this landscape it was um like mid-afternoon on an, an autumn day and really and i can i break it down further you know really beautiful color harmony and really in you know this road really brings your eye along and and then the next next thing, and this is kind of a secondary to that feeling of light and atmosphere, but it's just the the beauty of the various 
architectural elements of the city and this juxtaposition of you know you have these you know, these structural buildings and and then you have you have these trees that kind of it's kind of a, a balance of um how do i say it like forms that are you know not so much organic so much more, more organic yeah yeah it's a good way of putting it and so so i okay i've identified these are the things that are important to me in in this scene and now it's all about you know com composition and so what's not important to me about the subject is having every window and you know every car sharply de defined and in fact that's something i i kind of want to get a little bit away from is like so much repeating straight lines and so so i i knew to group a lot of the values you know in in the shadows of, of buildings close together and okay and, wait uh, so fine. so these so these values here in these buildings were further apart in person you you crunch them together so yeah so there so there are you know there are a lot of different colored buildings and some of them might be painted dark and some some of them might paint it white and but my feeling was that that kind of created a something too busy and i, I wanted to lead the eye down that road i didn't want your eye to be stuck in stuck in the corner where you have so much value contrast so there are different colors but i ended up making them all pretty similar in in terms of value and oh that's smart i just have to take a minute to thank each one of my generous patrons for your part in keeping this podcast going i could not continue to do it without you so thank you so much if you're not a patron yet but you love the show and you listen regularly please consider becoming a patron it's really easy to do and it doesn't have to break the bank. Just head over to theundrapedartist.com and click on the link, Be My Patron on Podbean. And then choose a monthly donation amount that fits your budget. It's that simple. Okay, so correct me if I'm wrong. So then you mentioned that the main, one of the main things that you're focused on, two things, two things actually. The juxtaposition between the vertical architectural structures and the organic forms that are the trees and the shrubs and stuff and then secondly that beautiful feeling of light coming across the painting and the shadows and lights dappled light that's coming across the street and stuff right yeah. so what you did is you simplified anything that wasn't accentuating those two relationships because yeah. what it looks like is that by simplifying this and say this building here, you've accentuated the way the light just passes right through the middle of the painting and drops these beautiful bands of light across the street. By, right. So is that, is that what you're doing? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That's really helpful. Yeah. Ah, I appreciate that. Man, that's a gorgeous one. Did you sell this one? No. No? Okay, we'll have to talk after. How big is this? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I okay. think something 20 something inches and it's Oh dang, it's too big. <laughs> I have a small house. <laughs> dang it. <laughs> I don't have room for big paintings anymore. Um, okay. So All right, let me I'm just going to pull up a couple more of your paintings here and we'll talk about them maybe a little bit. Another one, I guess this is kind of related to the last one in a way, where you did simplify a lot. I mean, you just basically oh. little brush strokes for the windows. I'm assuming some of them aren't even there that were there, particularly over on the side. Yeah, maybe uh -huh. you can tell me a little bit about how you organize this piece. 
Yeah, sure. So this this was a small one and done very, fairly quickly. But and the idea here was it's a kind of a, a storm's coming, but you've got these streaks of light still still coming in and illuminating landscape and that's something that I I painted quite a few times this this kind of idea where it, it creates this really dramatic effect mm -hmm. um, yeah and was this done plain this, air no this was um this was bef before before uh, a trip to Paris and so I was I was kind of warming up for for the trip okay because this would this light would change so fast yeah i mean as but, soon as that little know, gap in the sky closed up your toast you know i i do have a this is getting a little off topic but i i did have a a situation like that when i was planner painting in scotland and and you can scroll back up okay. in, in a little bit um where i i was painting on location this one down. yeah so that this one was done in the studio but it's um it's based on a, a plein air sketch that oh let's find that plein air let's go down down you want to go yeah. down go a little further oh right there. here yeah Oh yeah, so man! That, you painted fast. You had and you had. Look at that water. Is that water? Yeah, that's water. <laughs> <laughs> that's Scotland for you, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you know, I think this is something that's kind of important to address as a plein air painter is how to deal with moving light and fleeting effects. Um, a, lo a lot of painters would say don't chase the light and I happen to disagree with that I I think I see it as an advantage when you're planner painting over stu studio painting is you have access to 360 degrees of of subject and over however long you're painting you can get you can get ideas throughout that two, three hours that you might be out there painting. And it can be, it can be a problem if it causes you to, to become too indecisive and lose the focus of your original intent. But how I see it is that nature is constantly presenting you with different possibilities over you know like in every five minutes in this painting you know the light would be a different pattern and i don't think at any point it was the pattern that i ended up painting but i liked the idea that there was a that there are these spotlights kind of accentuating you know parts of this landscape like the the top of the waterfall and then a, a little bit kind of low, lower down to, to to balance the composition hmm. but um you know i would keep the rest of the values more compressed than what i was seeing when it's when it's just an overcast day to create room to make that highlight stand out more and i would wait for the highlight to get to the spots that i want and and put that in quickly and when it's not there i would just work on a different section hmm. and now you know if if i had not not done the sketch and i i just had a photo to work from in in the studio this would this would have been a completely different story. I would, I would either have, have to use a lot more imagination, or 
I would kind of be stuck with what one photo, the information that one photo gave me. So when you go back to the studio and you work from this study, did you get a photo of at least part? Because obviously you saw something that looks something like this in this one little section at one yeah. point, even though the rest of the painting might look different. Do you snap photos of particular moments and then combine them in the studio later? Or are you working just from this? Yeah, I, I, I had a camera with me um, while I was painting the whole time and I and every few minutes I would I would snap a quick picture as I see some hmm. something interesting in in the light effect so I could so you know I basically used a pretty similar pattern to the study but then the intricacies and subtleties of of smaller forms that you know require a little bit more time to develop that you can't can't really get all the information in this study I mm -hmm. I that in in my photo references that I, I could look at when I when I completed a studio version right so Kimball Geisler are you familiar with his work yeah he's exceptional right uh -huh. but he's um he said to me once that working in the studio on paintings actually helps him to be a better plain air painter everyone always says plain air painting helps you to be a better studio painter and he wouldn't deny that either but he also reversed it and said, but also painting in the studio has helped me to paint better outside. And what are your thoughts on that? I would agree with him. And I, I think, um, and but what I think, not necessarily painting in the studio, but you know, when you're out plein air painting, a, a lot of times you'll be, painting very quickly and but to me what is beautiful about nature is is the subtlety of it and the and when i make a painting i similar to nature you know in nature you can there's always more to explore you zoom in on a particular section you can go in all the way to ind individual trees and then next like individual leaves, branches, and you know, you want to get a magnifying glass, but the point being, you know, not that you have to paint all of that, but the overall feeling of the painting and the color harmony design, that's what draws you in to the painting, but I, I want there to be a little bit more to invite you to look longer and explore this painting, similar to the way that a beautiful landscape draws you in and and you it makes you want more. So you go on hikes and you explore you explore the different parts of the pencil landscape that you're seeing, you know, that same idea. And if you're always working quickly i think you're you're not giving yourself the the opportunity to to explore that aspect of of painting fully hmm. and so you know i but then the reverse is true you know if you're stuck if if you're always just doing these, these really long paintings, but then I think you're kind of limiting yourself a little bit also to, ex to explore some of your impulses and, and, the, and also just the mechanics of, um, of making, being decisive, making the decisions quickly and not not being overly, um, let's say, what's the right word? Like overly labored with, mm -hmm. with, when you paint. And also just the fact that you're learning directly from nature, I think is also really valuable 
so to me, it's a combination of both planner sketches and longer studio efforts that make you a great landscape painter. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is what you're saying, at least in part. But what I got from Kimball was that, and he's going to have to correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I think I took from Kimball. And that is that when you're in the studio, you have the luxury of taking your time to make decisions like, like you made here in the plain air painting. You have this time to compress the values in the foreground and accentuate the highlight on the hill in the background. And then, it, and then maybe try something different and then something different again, and then something different again. And then you can do that because you have all the time in the world, but then so that when you go out plain air painting, you have this whole library of successes and failures from the studio that you can draw upon when you get outside. Does that, does, does that make sense or uh, is that something you experience as well? Yeah, it does. But, you know, also one, one thing, however, that I would say you have to be careful of is that whenever you go out again, plein air painting, it's going to be a completely new set of, set of circumstances. So, mm -hmm. so it's good to be able to draw from your ex experience of problem solving, but it's also important to, to not become formulaic. Yeah. I guess that's, that's the trap that is really easy to fall into. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Which, which emphasizes your previous point, And that is you kind of need both, you kind of need to have a lot of experience outside and inside. Uh, outside, right. so you don't become formulaic. So you have more experience with the with an actual environment with real nature inside. So you have time to experiment and get into the nitty gritty. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've never done a landscape painting in my studio. I should try it sometime. Not not just a landscape. I've done landscapes in paintings okay. with figures, but I've never done just a landscape in my studio before. That'd be an interesting exercise. All right, so I want to pick out a couple more of my favorites here to talk about. And by the way, while I'm looking, you were in Salt Lake when? A couple times. Um, the one I mentioned about that was a long time ago, I think in 2018 or oh, okay. something like that. And then I was there, um, can't. 2022 to teach a workshop. Oh, were you at uh, Salt Lake workshops? Yeah. Freak dude, you know, that's like literally one mile from my studio. <laughs> if you're ever in Salt Lake again, you got to call me. I got to, yeah. I need to keep tabs on who's over there. When Stephanie came into town to teach a workshop there, we spent some time together. But um, I think a lot of people come in and don't and either don't want to see me or don't realize that I'm right next door practically <laughs> to their studio. I'm only a mile away. So next no, time you're in town, you'll have to look me up. But I had a good time teaching there. Um, it was in October. So the fall colors were spectacular and yeah. I definitely want to come back. So yeah. I'll yeah. So it's a good place to teach a workshop. All right. So maybe something a little bit different so maybe like a desert scene so it looks like you spent a lot of time in southern utah area too or maybe this is arizona where are you let's do this one actually where are you when you yeah. painted some of these so spent quite a quite a bit of time in northern arizona and southern utah area I think there's, you know, my background in, in geology mm -hmm. with landscapes such as these that you find in the Southwest, you can, you have a lot of, a lot of exposed rock formations and it's always fascinating to me that 
you can uncover so much of Earth's history with places like these. So this one is in the Vermilion Cliffs, and mm. and I I was there a long time ago, probably 2015 or 2016, and and I another one of those situations where I was working fast and the, the light was changing and so this was um this is a more recent painting but i was revisiting the the ideas from back then mm -hmm. oh you got a bunch of them here this all from the same trip or i'm just moving so to are, um i'm part of a group called Planner painters of america and we had a gathering um let's see this is i think 2022 mm -hmm. november and we had a gathering at capitol reef national park so yeah this was a plein air painting i i did from that trip and you know that was my first time going on a trip with with this group a lot of really phenomenal painters and, and a very beautiful and inspiring landscape, especially with the combination of these rocks and and yellow trees. It was just a very inspiring trip. Yeah. Yeah, the Southwest is incredible. We obviously, I live in Salt Lake, which is a high desert, yeah. but I'm originally from New York State. And I remember driving to Florida as a kid, driving all the way from the Hudson Valley in New York to Florida to go to Disneyland or Disney World. And everything looked the same for almost the entire 24 hour drive, 24 hours straight through. Mm -hmm. Everything looked basically the same, just freeways surrounded by deciduous trees right up until we got down Southern, if I remember right, really, Southern areas, or sorry, Southern um, Georgia, and then into Florida, where you started to see a little bit more like palm trees and this, that. And so what always amazes me about Utah is you could drive two hours from Salt Lake South and, and go through like four or five different types of geography. And, and it, it's incredible, the diversity here in the Southwest. It's a great place to landscape paint for anyone who hasn't been out this way. Uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, this has got to be only maybe four or five hours from where I'm from, and it looks nothing like where I live. It's only four or five I'm hours sure. away. Yeah, it's wild. Um, so tell me about what your plans are, because you're I mean, you're a freaking baby, um, and you're already painting masterfully. What's next? What, what's your long-term plan? Do you have, do you have big projects you'd hope to do someday? Are you kind of in a place where you're just, just excited to be where you are and just going to keep doing what you're doing for a while and ride, ride the wave? What's, what are you thinking? You know, for me, it's, it's all about the work that, that I want to do. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it's, it's never it seems to always lead to misery when I set myself goals for things that are outside of my control, such as if I, if I want to get in a particular show or win, win any particular award, you know, but I, I always have control over the kind of work that I do. And I, I would say for me, I, I want to, working on expanding my my creative creativity even more and having more ideas on how I can how I can edit things and and also that same same idea I was talking about where creating paintings that beyond the first look that's going to invite you to come for a second look and come for a third look where you you get more out of the painting every time 
Um, there's a painting at the Met, um, Joan of Arc by Lepage, that I think really does that well, where it's a, you notice it's beautiful value structure and design, and obviously the figure is painted beautifully, but you know, the it's a huge painting and you can only really see the bottom part of it up close, but you can really spend a lot of time this, like every branch is beautiful and the various textures and details in in the grass and various foliage foliage and the in the walls and these are this one right here right this one isn't that an exceptional painting i spent yeah. hours in front of that thing yeah so you know i think that's the that's the thing that really excites me about painting is um similar to nature how do we get people to keep finding more as they look and so that's why that painting really had a profound impact on me hmm. so are you hoping to do more large grand work like this is this something you're aspiring to Yeah, possibly. Hmm. Um, but I guess more in, I'm thinking more in, in the sense that even for, for my smaller works, I could find, also find ways to, to have aspects of the, of the painting that invite you to right. look further. So it's not so much the scale and complexity of the work that you're interested in. It's how it moved you, how it keeps drawing you in. That's what you're trying to get from it. Yeah. 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 This works something else and the combination of landscape and figure. It's so incredible. So incredible. I, know. I agree with you. That's one of my favorites in the Met too. Another painting that, that does that, um, this floral painting by Abbott Thayer, it's in, it's in DC and, you know, photos never really do that painting justice in my opinion, because when I, I've always loved that painting, but when I saw it in, in person, I, I love it even more. And it's for, I think the same thing, you know, the, the subtlety of, of color, when you look at it from afar, it's, you know, it's, there's the simplicity. It feels very, feels very poetic. And as, as you move in, but you know, not only detail, but you zoom, zoom in on, on the flowers, you, you can really notice the sensitivity of, of color where mm -hmm. in a way that, that it, it doesn't become too much to the point where it starts to break down the structure of, of the overall painting, but there's a lot of really subtle color notes within, you know, within the, the flower petals and, and then the. So when the you say subtle, you mean not garish. It's just that these colors yeah. are just, just slight hue shifts, not these garish jumps from pure yellow pigment to pure red pigment to pure blue pigment, but just subtle hue shifts Is yeah that what so you're saying? how i think think about this technically is that you you know i like to divide divide colors into groups and you know you you can do this with with pretty much every aspect of painting you you know you do do it with with value you can even do it with like shape design where you know this group let's call it group one in general, it's going to be, you know, this general color and group two is this general color. And when you step far away from the painting, it's those, the fact that you have these several distinct groups of values and, and color 
and that makes it a strong compelling image from far away if you break these down too much then let's say your your darks you put you know you put in too much reflected light into it and then the light where you turn the form you get your half tones too dark then you know the the image becomes weakened but then you know within each group you have these subgroups that you can keep breaking them down into but you know, the subgroups from group one and the subgroups from group two, they never get confused with each other. And I think that's having that is what what makes it's one of the aspects that can make a painting where you add a little bit more for the second look and the third look to notice the subtleties. Yeah. Yeah, that's really well said. I appreciate that. So, okay, so I got one final question for you. And yeah. if you've heard the podcast, you know the question. And uh -huh. that is, what advice would you give an aspiring artist? Maybe it's a piece of advice that you had that was really helpful, or it's something you wish you had. Can I get two? You can get as many as you want. It's your moment, okay. man. <laughs> All right, so... One of them is more um, more to be a better better painter. One of them is more as in uh, as in career advice. Okay. So to be a good painter, I think you need to allow yourself to have influences that are have a variety of influences, and I feel like this is the trap that a lot of students now are falling into you know they study at a at a school or an atelier and their teachers tell them this thing and they look at paintings that are all done by by the his or her teacher and or the, their influences and so they have this really really narrow mind of what makes good painting and i think down the road eventually you're going to have to break free from that and but it's not going to work if all your all the information you're feeding yourself is is limited to this one way of painting so and then the other advice of before you give that before, advice can i make a comment on that real quick yeah sure i'm 100 percent with you but it's not so much a comment as an experience so i had i was in a gallery many years ago i'm not represented anymore i do my own thing but it was a really good gallery and it showed all over the all over the world they had they had they had spaces all over the world and um they did really well for me i'm really grateful to have worked with them but um, I remember one time, and the reason I bring that up is because how relevant this is, how relevant the, the, the quality of the gallery is. I remember one time talking to the owner of the gallery and he said that he gets 300 or so applicate or submissions of art every week. And he said that if he gets another <laughs> atelier submission, he's going to throw up. And he says, if, if I get an Atelier student in here with their Atelier work, I, I send them right out the back door. He says, I'm so tired of it. And um, I think that's not to suggest that Ateliers are bad. They're not. I run an Atelier. But I think it goes to what you're saying, is that if you have too few influences, you're going to end up one of those artists where the galleries are like, I've seen you 299 times just this week. Like, right. <laughs> move along. Right. Is that yeah. what you're getting at? Yeah, exactly. But, you know, also, I, I think that, you know, you're, you know, when you're beginning in your art journey, you, we tend to be really Im impressionable, but, mm -hmm. and it's fine if you come out of an atelier looking like you were trained from that atelier but for 
I would say a, a lot of us, it's not, not necessarily just academic artwork that that's the reason that we were drawn in, into art. It's um, it probably art that goes beyond just technique and really speaks to the human experience that makes you excited to to pursue this path. But if you forget about that part and only focus on technique, and that's all your your painting is saying is showing you how well I can model form and or how how well I know anatomy stuff like that. Then I think that's that's a shame if that's all you end up getting at if you can go so much further with it. It's great that you've already learned that lesson. It took me a long time to learn that lesson. I used to poo poo art that was not objective. And if an artist couldn't draw, I was like, eh, not interested, not art. And then I was part of a show called Picasso, Monet to Picasso. Wait, was that what it's called? Anyway, it doesn't matter. But it had original Van Goghs in it. Uh -huh. I'd never seen original Van Goghs in a whole bunch of them. Like, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 of them. And yeah. uh, I used to not like Van Gogh at all. I'd only seen it in books and I was like, eh, he can't draw. And then I saw them in person and it, I had a similar experience to when I'm standing in front of a landscape that I can't mm -hmm. understand why it's so beautiful with these paintings. There was nothing academic about it. I couldn't figure out why it was so beautiful, but I looked at it and was just like enamored with its beauty. And I was completely humbled to realize that there's so much more to art than just learning how to draw well. It was a yeah. huge awakening for me. I mean, I still appreciate good drawing. Don't get me wrong. I still uh -huh. think I still think a great artist should pursue, or someone aspiring to be great, artist should pursue all the skills of art making. But I learned that, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's a lot more to painting than just making a thing look like a thing. Yeah, you know, I I really like one thing that I hear you say a lot on this podcast where you're talking about you know the tech technical aspects is in service of your artistic idea mm -hmm. i think that that kind of sums it up pretty well yeah yeah i, I definitely feel strongly about that this um this technique to express what's meaningful to you and not the technique being an end of itself right right okay so what's your career advice so my my career advice is find people who are excited to work with you not just places where you can get prestige hmm. i think um you know i like galleries for example I would much rather be in, in a gallery where they're, it may be not as much of a prestigious gallery, but if they are very invested in, in promoting my work, sharing it with other people, you know, that is going to take you so much further than if you were to get in a gallery with all these big names and Sure, it may be good on your resume to include that gallery on, you know, on your resume, but it's not going to do you any good mm -hmm. if they put your work in, in the storage area, or, or they they just don't put an effort to market your work because if they they sell one of your paintings, you they they get like like half or even less than if they were to market someone else that's more expensive. So, you know, why put yourself in that position if you can actually find find the people that will go the extra mile for you? Dude, I don't, okay, I hope I don't come off condescending at all, but you're constantly impressing me with your age and wisdom, where your limited age and extensive wisdom, because that's another thing that I learned along the way 
and I don't know how long it took me to figure out, but you are spot on. And I, I tell my students, it's like, you should find a gallery that is head over heels into you, not a gallery that you're head over heels into them. Right. You know, most of us look for the ones where we're like, oh, it's the greatest. Oh my gosh, I just would kill to be part of that gallery. No, it's got to yeah. be the gallery where they say, oh, I would just kill to have Kyle Ma in my gallery. I mean, to a point, obviously, <laughs> any low, low end gallery is going to want Kyle Ma and, and high end, but one that can sell your work, but just obsessed with you so that they work hard. Like you said, that's really good advice. I owe a lot of my um, success in my career to that, to having a few galleries that were re that felt lucky to have me, whether they should have or shouldn't have. And they pushed my work really, really hard. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I was fortunate, fortunate to have that because I don't know that I did it on purpose. It just, I got lucky, but you're thinking yeah. about this stuff already. So that's exceptional advice. Yeah. I appreciate that. So, Hey man, it's awesome to have you on the podcast. I got to tell you for, do me a favor. <laughs> I, you're, you seem like a really humble guy for the amount of talent you have. Stay that way. You know, stay sure. humble because, uh, you'll continue to grow and just be better and better all the time. And it's just a breath of fresh air to meet someone with your talent and, and your humility. So I, uh, I'm honored to have you on the show. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to the undraped artist podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe. And if you could leave a comment or review that really helps the channel. Please share the show with your friends, and if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.